And so all of these ideas are pretty you know, new when you think about them. Again, a lot has happened in these past three years, but you have to sort of start to think about where did all of this come from? And now we're going to talk about this book here by Eric Topol. This is The Creative Destruction of Medicine, How the Digital Revolution Will Create Better Healthcare. And this is not really the source of where everything came from, but it actually goes through in pretty good detail and describes a lot of what led to where we currently are today and really sets the picture and the tone for where we're going over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 plus years. And so when he uses the term creative destruction of medicine, we're talking about transformation that accompanies radical innovation. That's the term creative destruction. And this book has a lot of good things in it, and we're actually making this sort of your textbook for the course. If you're a UCI student, you're going to get this textbook sort of free as part of their course. Otherwise, it's worth the money. Um, please check it out. It's a great book. I have no ties to the author. I have no profit sharing from this, but it's a really good book if you're considering um, you know, how technology plays into your practice of healthcare. So we'll kind of talk about this a little bit more here. And you know, in the book, he's got a lot of cool diagrams, and this is one of them. And it just talks about this whole progression of you know, how technology is accelerating. And these are all these sort of things that play into why we are where we at, are at today with medicine. You have the cell phone, personal computer, internet, digital devices, and you can see this really kind of almost exponential upgrowth in the acceleration of technology. And all these different things that he talks about actually have a very significant play as far as how medicine is practiced and how we're teaching medicine and how patients are interacting with medical providers. If you look at this next diagram, he kind of talks about this concept of old medicine um, that's you know sort of pre-2000 medicine uh, 1990s medicine 20th century medicine and all these different things wireless genomics wireless sensors genomics imaging information systems mobile devices internet increased computing power power data universe data storage all of these things are kind of converging together and going through this kind of creative destruction, this radical innovation and transformation into new medicine, or sort of what we're going to now call modern medicine, or you know, becoming a digital physician. And so when you look a little bit further, you know, one of the things that he talks about are these different factors that lead to this super convergence, super convergence and new medicine. And it's kind of these four concepts, these four C's, you know, you have constant connectivity. And again, just think about in perspective, three years ago, five years ago, you know, now you're always connected on your smartphone or on your device. You know, there used to be a time where you would check your email at work, you would check it at home by dialing in, and it was a pretty big ordeal to actually get on the internet. Now in your pocket, in your bag, on multiple devices, you're always connected to the internet. You can always Google something, you can always have access to data, and that's a very important piece that makes all of this change in medicine. He talks about collaboration and crowdsourcing, and these are the sites, these collaborative sites, YouTube, Groupon, Living Social, Yelp, Facebook, Wikis, Twitter, all these things, you know, collaboration sets up the world of crowdsourcing by getting all this content aggregated from multiple, multiple different sources. We talk a little bit about customized consumption, and here's where the key term is hyper-personalization. And this is the key term, the buzzword, the theme of the day, that you know you go on the web you go onto these sites you have all your preferences in there all the content that comes directly to you is content that you want that you customize it comes in your um, inbox on your device on your screen and these are the things that again if you think about how that could apply to medicine your patient lists your patients your diseases all those different things can come directly towards you and of course cloud computing you no longer have to have your device in front of you to get to your information. You just need to have any device or a device in front of you, and you can always have access to your own personal data wherever you are. You know, Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, all those perfect examples. Now, all of these things together kind of put together this push towards disruption 
and that creative destruction that we talked about, you know, and then you have all these other side effects of all of this, you know, dealing with all this extra data, you know, having a data driven culture, but these are all these kind of, you know, general talking points that the book goes through in the first couple chapters that really help frame this whole discussion of where we are and where we are going. So another concept that I wanted to talk about and just get you familiar with is this technology adoption life cycle. Um, this was initially put together by Everett Rogers and in many other iterations has it been talked about and discussed. Uh, Jeffrey Moore uh, has talked about this concept as well in sort of the business and technology literature. And what it really refers to is this whole kind of diffusion model, um, how ideas and how technology gets adopted by the society as a whole. You have your innovators on the kind of the bleeding edge early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and laggards. And the one thing that Jeffrey Moore talks about is between each one of these groups, there's a very distinct set of motivations and values that sort of define them and allow them to, you know, when they're looking at a situation, when they're analyzing a technology, say, you know, these are the certain criteria that'll make it okay for me to go ahead and adopt and try something new. And these are pretty, even though it's a very continuous bell-shaped curve, he talks about how this, this space between the groups is very vast, you know, and very deep and very, um, you know, very almost restrictive to crossing that. So he refers to that whole diffusion between groups as crossing the chasm. And so you have to sort of think about when we talk about all these technologies for health and all these disruptive technologies and all this creative destruction of medicine, you know, where do you sort of fall in this bell-shaped curve? And then more importantly, you know, why do you fall within that area? Are you an innovator? Are you on the bleeding edge? Are you a laggard and you want to make sure that a solution is well vetted and everyone else is on board before you hop on? And those are the things that are important to figure out because that kind of dictates, you know, where you are going to be with sort of the modern delivery of healthcare. And like I said, you don't have to always be on the bleeding edge but you should be aware that there are going to be people pushing that envelope being that early two and a half percent and it's important to figure out what they're doing and how that could eventually relate to you now at uc irvine uh, we were very fortunate to have the vision of a dean who after just seeing the iPad um, you know, in the hands of a colleague and playing around with it for a short amount of time, you know, saw the bookshelf, saw the ability to consolidate information, to display all sorts of audio and video and sort of interactive content. And he thought, wow, this is great for games and fiction and other reading and news and email. Imagine what this could do for medical education. And so, you know, a lot of our program when it started in August of 2020, 10 was based off of this simple email here from our dean that said you know so here's an idea a radical idea for your consideration we purchase an ipad for every student and load the first years with all of the texts they would need you know a simple email like that really got this whole thing in motion it was that spark that really set things off and from there you know he we sort of developed this whole kind of belief system or ethos behind what we were going to do with technology at UC Irvine and we and he summed it up here as saying that we are committed to using evolving technology to benefit the education of our medical students it is our firm belief that a digitally based curriculum will be the wave of the future and UCI seeks to be a leader in the innovative presentation of information to students and again, that sort of sets the tone for what we've done here on our campus. And again, when you think back to that curve, it really puts us in that early, you know, quarter, that early innovator, that early adopter phase. And that's, you know, kind of defines what we've done here at UC Irvine. We've been sort of risk. We haven't been risk averse because a lot of what we've done hasn't been well vetted. There's not a lot of good data out there, but we see the potential of it. And what drives a lot of this forward in this health 2.0 movement is not so much, you know, well vetted, um, fully thought out, fully tested and beta tested solutions. These are ideas that are put forth by, you know, patients. These are ideas that are put forward by industry, by physicians, by students 
all that could have a very positive impact and take people that are willing to make that leap to cross that chasm and move forward. Now, this concept is talked about a little bit when we talk about this idea of the tipping point, you know, the idea of where an event that's previously a rare phenomenon becomes rapidly and more dramatically, you know, dramatically more common. Now, this idea of the tipping point was first coined in its sociological use by Morton Grodson's, and it sort of was uh, based off of this analogy with physics, you know, that by adding a small amount of weight to a balanced object can cause it to suddenly and completely topple. And again, you know, it makes sense that you hit that sort of critical mass and it allows things to kind of move forward and kind of um, flood forward and, and, and progress. And Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, The Tipping Point, also describes this whole process, this moment of critical mass, and he sort of likens this, you know, ideas and products and messages and behaviors sort of like viruses, and they're infectious and they spread. And that's, you know, once someone gets, gets infected with an idea, you know, they talk about it and they allow it to grow and grow and multiply, and eventually gets to that point where it just starts spreading to more and more individuals. And I think that's how a lot of this Health 2.0 movement has really gone from um, something almost unheard of, you know, five, ten years ago, even three years ago, to being more and more commonplace each day, each week, each month. And if you look at that progression of how things have gone with technology, it'll help make sense of where things are going to go in the future. And so I think by understanding that, or at least having a concept of that, you know, having patients drive this process, having medical students and other kind of non-traditional innovators move this whole momentum, it helps kind of put this in perspective. Now, for an even kind of better idea of what we're talking about with movements, uh, here's a great TED Med talk by Derek Sievers, and he talks about it in a lot more detail here. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, Three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed. But they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So. Over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. So great. So you just watched the video from Derek Seavers and you, and you can kind of see in, in much more kind of comical and more, I guess, uh, easier to relate ideas of how this whole technology adoption, adoption curve works and how this whole technology diffusion of innovation works. It really depends on, you know, the concepts of risk, the concepts of, you know, feeling left out, feeling inclusive, trying to do things that are unique. And it's really important to see, you know, him describe that, you know, the first follower is that understated, uh, has that understated role of leadership, you know, that it's that first follower 
that transforms a lone nut into a leader. And you know, talking about how everyone on that initial early adopter innovator phase is treated as equals, that they're not necessarily emulating the first person, but they're emulating the others. And I think it's really important to think about those concepts when when you look at technology. I mean, that's the sort of happened with this iPad, this mobile technology in the medical education movement. And we've gone from a small handful of schools, including ourself and Stanford and University of Central Florida and a handful of others to 34 schools now. And they're all very different in how they put their programs together, but they share a lot of the similar challenges and, um, and successes too because they all have a lot of similarities and they each you know emulate other aspects of other programs and so when we look at these new dif diffusion of ideas and the way that healthcare is progressing i think it's important to look at people that are doing innovative things and though you may not take all the lessons from them it's important to take some lessons from them and see if you could apply those kind of more locally on your own